Elhamdülillahi Rabbil Alemin Ve salatu ve selam Ala Zeyd-i Muhsinin Nebiyyina Muhammed Ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecmain Ve yaskala subhanahu wa ta'ala That he blesses us through this book And that he makes us of those Who are guided and misguided others Likewise we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala That we find an attachment To his speech And that it helps us to become better people And he makes us of those who are blessed Wherever we may be uh, last week we began the tafsir of Surah Kahf and we reached to the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says فَلَأَلَّكَ بَاكِ وَنَفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ ثَارِهِمْ إِلَّا مِنْ يُؤْمِنُ بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَسَفَ Ayah number 6 But before we do that, let's look at the previous five ayahs very quickly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala break, begins this surah by praising himself subhanahu wa ta'ala with perfection and completion with awe and love from the one that is praising him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we mentioned within the suburb of Nuzul and the reason why this ayah or why this surah was revealed is because the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam waited for two months, or sorry, two weeks, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam waited for two weeks for this surah to be revealed. Alhamdulillah, the Anzala ala abdul kitab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises himself for revealing the book upon his servant and this is the most complete form of description that a person can ever receive from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is a servant of Allah we all try to be servants of Allah but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has affirmed servitude for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he is the one who received the kitab and there was no uh, crookedness placed within it qayyima it is upright. And from the lessons of this, that there is no crookedness and that it is upright, is that the person who connects himself to the kitab and the servitude that Muhammad left behind for us as an example, it will make you upright. It will make you upright. Also, what we learn from this is that the Quran is factual and there are no contradictions in it. Hence Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَلَمْ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ عِوَجَ There is no crookedness in it, meaning there are no contradictions in it. قَيِّمًا It is upright. لِيُنْذِرَ بَأْسًا شَدِيدًا مِنْ لَدُنْهُ وَيُبَشِّرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ So that a person can receive a warning from this book and the following of this messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But also glad tidings for the believers who listen to him. الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ الصَّالِحَاتِ the believer is the one who does good deeds. The believer is the one who does good deeds. And this connects for us Iman with actions. And if you do this, لَهُمْ أَجْرٌ hasana, You will have a great, de- great deal of reward. مَا فِيهِ أَبَدًا And they will stay therein for eternity. What we also learn from this and the coming ayat is that okay we'll mention this later also this book has come and this messenger has come to warn those people who have deviated in aqidah and to the extent that they have included kufr and shirk in their aqidah where they have said that God has a son far above Allah is above that description they have no knowledge of it and they are following their forefathers characteristic number two that Imam Sa'di gives in his tafsir and as a result without knowledge and blind following and then a despicable word came out from their mouths as a result of what? ignorance and blind following all that is left is that they speak of Allah they speak of religion except falsehood. Ignorance, blind following, leads to foul speech, leads to lying upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a summary of the first five ayat, and this is where we stopped. Now we are ayah number six, and inshallah in today's session we'll be looking at the tafsir of the people of the cave. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins their mention here, or forward 
towards their mention here in ayah number 6 and it continues to ayah number 26 and inshallah this is what we'll be covering today now the message of Allah let's remind ourselves told the people to come back and he will give them information and ilm about the people of the cave but he didn't say inshallah and as a result wahi was detained and it was delayed and after two weeks of not receiving revelation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now talks to his Prophet. And he tells him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not to despair and not to take to heart their rejection. This is what we find in ayah number six. But also later, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in ayah number 22, gives him another instruction, which is do not debate with them. Do not sit with them and ask them about their knowledge. Do not be concerned about how they have corrupted the revelation that has come from before. So there are two things that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is being told in these ayahs in the early part of Surah Al-Kahf. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam perhaps فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخِرُ نَفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ فَأَلْهِمْ إِمْ لَمْ يُؤْمِنُ بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَسَفَا Perhaps you will despair if they do not listen to you. What I've got here in the translation is, perhaps you would kill yourself, O Muhammad, in grief over their footsteps, meaning turning away, because they do not believe in this narration, meaning the Qur'an. This is what it says in the translation. So the first instruction in the early part of this surah is to tell Muhammad wasallam, don't despair. In ayah number 22, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَا تُمَارِ فِيهِمْ إِلَّا مِرَاءً ظَاهِرًا وَلَا تَسْتَفْتِ فِيهِمْ مِنْهُمْ أَحَدًا Do not debate with them, except that with you have clear proof, meaning you can speak to them, you can have a dialogue with them, you explain to them that this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed, and you don't need to get into an argument. You don't need to say, well, you're wrong because of this and that. What do you have in your books? What do you believe in? You don't need to get into all of that. فَلَا تُمَارِ فِيهِمْ Do not debate with them. إِلَّا مِرَاءً ظَاهِرًا Except that you explain it to them. وَلَا تَسْتَفْتِ فِيهِمْ مِنْهُمْ أَحَدًا And you have no reason to consult the people of Scripture about what they have uh, in their series of events for the people of the cave. And in this, this book has been revealed to Muhammad وسلم, as a guidance for all of mankind. This is not something which is specific to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, you person of iman, or person of good deeds, do not despair with the turning away of those who want to turn away. And do not try and convince people, overly try and convince people, because most people will not listen. There is no need for you to try and convince and try and force people to believe. There is no need for you to debate. What is upon you is to explain. And if they accept, alhamdulillah, and if they don't, then you have no concern about what they believe in. These are some benefits that we learn from these early ayats. But let's go back to ayah number six. Perhaps you will kill you. This is what it says in the translation. Perhaps you will kill yourself, O Muhammad, in grief over their footsteps, meaning the turning away from the Qur'an, turning away from Islam, because they don't believe in this narration, which is the Qur'an. Now this is problematic. And I would say that this is even a mistake in the translation of the Qur'an into English. The person who has translated it, uh, Shaykh Al-Allama Taqiyyuddin Al-Hilali, may Allah mercy on him, and Muhsin Khan, who has passed away recently, Allah mercy on him also, they have gone with one tafsir of this ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخِئٌ نَفْسَكَ They have gone with the tafsir. This is a legitimate tafsir. But I feel it's not the correct one as we will explain. That you will kill yourself, O Muhammad. Now, Ibn Kathir and others from the ulama have rejected this tafsir. They will give an alternative tafsir. And the reason why is is it possible for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanting to kill himself because they were turn away? Meaning he gives the explanation to the people 
of disbelief amongst them, and if they don't listen, he wants to kill himself. Does that even make sense? Doesn't make sense for any mu'min, let alone a nabi. Let alone, and this is the belief of Ahlul Sunnah, that the Anbiya and the Messengers are free from major sin. So how is it possible that the Messenger of Allah would kill himself? Therefore, this is a view in Tafsir, and this is found in the English translation. But another view of the people of Tafsir, is stronger. And what is that second opinion? Ibn Kathir, he said, لا تأسف عليهم Meaning, perhaps you will become sad if they do not accept your call. بَلْ أَبْلِغُهُمْ رِسَالَةُ الله. But what is upon you is to convey to them the message of Allah, Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, فَلَعَلَّكَ بَانْفِرْ نَسَّكَ عَلَىٰ ثَارِهِمْ إِنْ لَمْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَزَفَى means you will become sad, but don't become sad. But continue trying to explain to them even though that they are turning away. So Ibn Kathir goes on to say, don't be sad, explain and convey to them the message. فَمَنْ اِهْتَدَى فَلِنَفْسِ And whoever is guided, then he will be guided for the right reason. وَمَنْ دَلَّ فَإِنَّمَا يَدِلُّ عَلَيْهَا And those people who are misguided, then he's only misguiding himself. فَلَا تَذْهَبْ نَفْسُكَ عَلَيْهِمْ حَسَرَاتٍ Do not put yourself in a sadness because of the fact that they are turning away. Therefore the tafsir of ayah number 6 means you are everly eager, you are really eager for them to become believers and for them to listen. And this is good. But don't become sad if they turn away. Continue to persevere, continue to explain, but don't become sad and don't give up. Hence ayah number seven. Inna ja'alna ma'al ardi zinatan laha li nabluahum ayyuhum ahsanu amala. We have made on earth a beautification so that we will test them which one of them are best in deeds. Imam al-Tabari ibn Jarir al-Tabari in his tafsir he said that this ayah means li nakhtabir ibadina. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this earth for you, and then he has beautified it, and he has made upon earth zina, a beautification, attraction, enjoyment, and pleasure. So that we will test them which one are best in deeds. So at Dabari in the eye of number seven, in the series of number seven, he said, لِنَخْتَبِرْ إِبَادَنَا أَيُّهُمْ أَتْرَقْ لَهَا وَاتَّبَعْ لِأَمْرِنَا وَنَهِينَا وَعَمَلُوا فِيهَا بِطَاعَتِنَا Which one is going to follow the commandments that we have given? Which one is going to stay away from those things that we have made prohibited? Which one of you are going to do the deeds that we have uh, told them to do so that they will become obedient slaves of ours? Therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ayah number 7 is saying here, we have made the earth a beautification so that you will become good indeed. Not that you cling on to the life of the dunya. Not that you think that the dunya is the objective. This dunya has beauties within it so that you will then realize the power and the qudra and the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over you so that you will do then good deeds. As a lesson from this ayah, our Shaykh Shaykh Saad al-Shathri, Allah preserve him, he said, Notice here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says أَيُّهُمْ أَحْسَنُ amala." Which one of you is best in deeds? Not أَيُّهُمْ أَكْثَرُ amala." Not which one of you is plentiful in deeds. Now, of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be plentiful in deeds but those deeds have to have a certain quality. If a person is doing lots of good deeds but the quality isn't there or if a person is doing lots of deeds but those deeds are innovated or if a person is doing lots of deeds but there's no ikhlas all of that is not ahsanu amala. Hence Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the dunya. He has created the stars. He has created the sun. He has created the moon. He has created everything that you see within it. The clouds and the trees and water and spouses. And he has given you rizq day and night. For what reason? This ayah gives you the purpose of existence.
Inna ja'alna ma'al ardi zina. Everything on earth, everything in the life of this dunya is a zina. Why? Li nabluwahum ayyuhum ahsanu amala. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after, like we have said before, two weeks of no revelation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, number one, don't despair. Continue. And then reminds him of the purpose of existence. And in this, you can find in these three, a great deal of goodness for the people of Iman. This is the same advice that we give to the people who want to practice their religion in this day and age. Don't despair, remain steadfast, and remind yourself the purpose as to why you exist, why anything exists. Ayah number eight. وَإِنَّ لَجَعِلُونَ مَا عَلَيْهَا سَعِيدٌ جُرُزًا The translation here it says, And verily we shall make all that is on it, meaning earth, a bare dry soil. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now there is two tafsirs to this also from the ulama of tafsir. Number one is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the earth barren and he has made it for you to go there and cultivate. He's made the earth perfect. He's made it fertile for you. For what reason? So that you cling on to the life of dunya? Of course not. But also what we learn from this, and this has been mentioned by Ibn Abbas and others, that the dunya has been made beautiful, but there are two types of people that are looking at the life of the dunya. There is no third. You and you and you and you and I and everyone looks at the dunya in one particular way and other people look at the dunya in another particular way. There's no other attitude towards the life of the dunya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, وَإِنَّا لَجَاعِلُونَ مَا عَلَيْهَا سَعِيدٍ جُرُزَ Ibn Abbas radiallahu an He said, يَهْلِكُ كُلُّ شَيْنْ عَلَيْهَا وَيَبِيدٍ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here that we will make the earth a bare, dry soil. It means that everyone will have the life of this dunya go back to it as it was, everything wiped out. Therefore, who are the two types of people? One who clings on to the life of this dunya, he's only clinging on to dust. That's what he's clinging on to. He's clinging on to mud. No matter how beautiful the mud looks, no matter how expensive the mud is being sold to you, it is mud, and this is what it will go down to. So, so for the people of understanding, as Ibn Abbas anhuma, he said, Every single one of us, the people of Iman, know that the life of this dunya will be destroyed. Hence, why are you here? To test you which one of you are best in deeds, while you have the ability to do them, while you are walking on this earth, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will destroy it. Therefore, that's why we do good deeds. Because we understand the purpose of our existence and the existence of earth itself. But the second group of people who do not understand the purpose of the life of this dunya and the reason why the dunya exists is that they cling on to it. But what are they clinging on to? They are clinging on to bare, dry soil. There's no benefit to it. Therefore, the ulama of tafsir, and again, and this is one of the principles in tafsir, and again, this is something I think we would need to go into in further detail, perhaps in a separate sitting. Usul al is extremely important. I've just given you now, in more than one ayah, two opinions from the ulama of tafsir. Does that mean they contradict one another? Sometimes they will, but most of the time they won't. And this is known as al-ikhtilaf al-tanawwa. Ikhtilaf al-tanawwa is when you have more than one interpretation but you can reconcile them. Hence Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, وَإِنَّ لَجَائِلُونَ مَا عَلَيْهَا سَعِيدٌ جُرُزًا We will make the earth bare and dry, dry soil. It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the earth perfect for you to live on. The most complete environment. But in another tafsir is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will destroy this earth and everything will be wiped out. And it is only the people of the, of the Akhirah will benefit and understand that it is going to go back to that. Is there a contradiction? There is no contradiction. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the first tafsir has made the earth for a particular purpose, which is the beginning of it, 
which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created it for a particular purpose. And the second tafsir is looking at the consequence and the end result, which is that everything will be destroyed and we return back to Allah. Therefore, in these ayat, ayah number 6, 7, 8, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, do not despair. Continue and have sabr and remind yourself of the purpose as to why you exist in the akhirah. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the account of the people of the cave. أَمْ حَسِبْتَ أَنَّ أَسْحَابُ الْكَهْفِ وَالْرَقِيمِ كَانُوا مِنْ آيَاتِنَا عَجَبًا Translation says, do you think that the people of the cave and inscription, Raqim, were a wonder amongst our signs? <coughs> now again, the ulama of tafsir have two possible explanations. Ibn Abbas, he said, do you think, O Muhammad, that the ilm that we have given you, الَّذِينَ آتَيْتُكَ مِنُ الْإِلْمِ وَالسُنَّةِ وَالْكِتَابِ that we have given you knowledge, we have given you Qur'an, we have given you Sunnah. Afdal min sha'ni ashab al-kafi wa raqim Do you think that what happened to the people of the cave is better as a miracle than what we have given to you, O Muhammad? Rhetorical, of course. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that now we are going to explain to you about the people of the cave, but before we do that, Let's tell you about the virtue of you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, by the virtue of ilm and sunnah and the kitab. Now this is the raising of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the kitab and this ummah without any doubt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, yes, we did give a miracle to the people of Cape, but what we've given to you is far greater. Now this is our ayah for us all. The kitab is still amongst us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved the people of the cave. Yes, these are ayat which have a great deal of barakah that we talked about the virtues of these ayat in, uh, in the previous session. Yes, companion was reciting it, tranquility came down. It's a savior from the Masih al-Tijal and, you know, many different virtues of, of this surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, according to the tafsir of Abdullah ibn Abbas, or the Allahumma, that what you have still amongst you now, in your heart, in your recitation, in your minds, in your lives, is a greater miracle that the people of the cave would have ever received. And they live to be 300 years plus. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve them, as we will see. So, Ibn Abbas, he's saying about this ayah here, do you think that, do you think that looking at the story of the people of the cave, this is something for you to marvel at? Tafsir number one of this ayah, what we have given you, is a greater source of amazement. Another uh, view from the ulama of tafsir of this ayah, Am Hasibta Anna Sama Kafir Al Qim Kanmin Ayatin Ajaba, ayah number nine, is that, and this is what is obvious uh, and, and, and clear from the understanding, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, is that now we will explain to you the answer to the question that the people have asked you. Meaning, <laughs> Do you think uh, about the people of the cave and inscription that they were amazing ayat and miracles? Meaning, now we are going to tell you about them. And again, there is no contradiction. اختلاف <laughs> one. Ashab al Kahf are the people of the cave, but what is Raqim? Who are the people of inscription? What does inscription mean here? Now, in the translation I've got here, it says the news or the names of the people. Now, what this means is, is that some of the ulama have said inscription refers to. Inscription refers to the news, meaning the village. Meaning the people of the cave and the village with them. There was a, a miracle that happened to all of them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is including them all. And this has been uh, given as a possible tafsir by some of the ulama, such as Ka'ab al-Ahbar. Ka'ab al-Ahbar. 
He said that Ar-Raqim refers to the village itself. But Ar-Raqim inscription with many of the ulama of Tafsir, such as Ibn Abbas, uh, Ibn Zayd, the son of Zayd bin Thabit, Abdurrahman bin Zayd, Sayyid bin Jubair, and others, they have said inscription means the names of the people inside of the cave. Meaning, when they entered into the cave, their names were inscribed inside of the cave. Ayah number nine. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, do you think that this is a miracle for you to marvel at? Meaning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now going to bring in a description of the people in the cave. Ayah number 10. إِذْ أَوَلْ فِتْيَةُ إِلَى الْكَهْفِ There were a group of young men when they fled for refuge into the cave. فَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا آتِنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةِ وَهَيِّئْ لَنَا مِنْ أَمْرِنَا رَشَدًا And they said, and they made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our Lord, bestow upon us mercy from yourself and facilitate for us our affairs upon the right way. Either will fit you to al-kaf. They fled into the cave seeking refuge. Why did they flee? What were they seeking refuge from? And the ulama of tafsir, and this is quite extensive in the books of tafsir, to summarize, these young men were upon the religion of Isa ibn Maryam. So this comes after Isa. So it's between Isa and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These young men were upon Tawheed. They were upon the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without making shirk to him. There was a Roman king. Now you have to remember at this time, Rome had rejected Isa alayhi salam and they were upon shirk. And it was many years, centuries after really, that the Roman uh, Empire established itself as a, a firmly Christian empire. But for many decades after Isa alayhi salam, they were still upon shirk. This Roman king, his name has been reported as being Daqianus. He was upon shirk. And anyone who was upon the religion of Isa, meaning Tawheed, he was forcing them to leave their religion and adopt his religion, which was the religion of shirk. Before we talk about this any further, remember this surah is a surah which gives the believer and the reciter insight into fitna. Insight into fitna. And the ulama have explained that in this surah there is a fitna of ilm and religion and youth. Hence the whole surah has been named after these people, the people of Kahf, because they were brought to fitna as a count to their religion. They were being forced to leave the religion of Allah. And this is the sunnah of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows this to occur in his creation. We're talking about this thousands of years ago. And it's still extremely relevant now and it become even more relevant as we move forward. Islam will become strange if it isn't strange already. And it will continue to become even more strange. And it is already strange in some parts of the world where some people they see La ilaha illallah as a threat. And anyone who says La ilaha illallah, we will force that person into detention. And we will force that person to change his religion. This surah is a guidance, just like the whole Quran is a guidance. But this surah is a guidance protecting the believer and the one who studies it against fitna. Fitna of your religion, fitna of you being led astray whilst you were young. This man, Daqiyanus, was forcing them to apostate from the religion of Tawheed. And he was forcing them to perform shirk. So they fled into the cave. What did they do? They made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, give us a mercy from yourself, a direct mercy, O oh Allah. Min ladunka rahmah. 
a divine mercy upon us because we need your help. And this is the station of the believer. No believer on the face of this dunya can ever think that they can achieve anything except for the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is part of your salat and your salat will not be accepted unless you admit weakness and servitude to Allah. What happens if you don't say this line in the salat? What happens if you don't say Is your salat valid? It's not valid. In order for your salat to be valid, you have to say, Oh Allah, I am weak. And you are my master. And I am your servant. You are the one that created me. I am completely insignificant. I submit myself to you. There's nothing that I can ever achieve except through your help. I'm your servant. I need your help for everything. I need your help in my very existence. Because if my soul isn't in my body, and that's what you have decreed, I will not be alive. I need your assistance in my worship. I need your assistance in every affair. These people, they said, Rabbana atina min ladunka rahma. We need your assistance, Ya Allah. This man, Daqianus, and you can change that name and you can insert a different name here throughout history, is forcing us to leave our religion. Just like the Dajjal will force you to leave your religion. That's if somebody doesn't force you to leave your religion before that. Atina min ladunka rahma. O Allah, give us a mercy and assist us from yourself. Lana min amrina rashida. All of our affairs, O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, facilitate. That's all we can ask. We're in the cave now. That's, that's all we know we can say now. What else can we do? This, if we stand outside, we'll fall upon shirk. And we'll never be successful, as we will see. This is exactly what they will say. So we're hiding out in this cave, no food, no drink, no furniture, no family members. It's just us and a bunch of other youth, as we will see in a moment. What do we have? Nothing, not even a pillow to put their heads on, perhaps. This, my brothers and sisters, teaches the importance of servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the need that you have for the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and constant worship. Now you are in a time of ease. Don't use that ease to become lazy in worshipping Allah. Or perhaps even worse, distancing yourself from Allah. This is a time for steadfastness. Because in the time of difficulty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because of your steadfastness and ease, will facilitate ease for you in your hardship. Remember Allah, He will remember you. Also what we learn as a benefit from this ayah is the importance. Now, the ulama have talked about them as being young men. But that idea here applies to us all, whether you're 14 or 40, makes no difference. That you will be tested. But perhaps them being young is an insight here because the young are highly impressionable, they are easy to follow, you will change your idea. If your friend says to you something, then you might listen to him. Even though he, if he's telling you something bad. So the youth will be tested, and perhaps they are being tested the most with all these different things that they see and they hear and all these things. Now, next line. Allah subhanahu wa So now, in line number 10, they made dua, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً وَهَيِّئْ لَنَا مِنْ أَمْرِنَا رَشَدًا آيَ نَبِي لَبَنْ فَضَرَبْنَا Now here, Al-Sa'di, رحمه الله, he said, فَ In the English here, I've got therefore. In the Arabic language, this is known as فَ التعقيب, which basically means, therefore, probably not the best, not the word that I would use, because it doesn't capture the benefit that Saturday is giving us. They made dua. And instantly then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded. Fa. And you will find this in the Quran in many places. If you want to pray, then instantly make wudu. 
This is the fa again. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about uh, making dua to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about support. فَإِنَّ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ قَرِيبٌ Surely and the help of Allah is close, etc. Therefore, this is now a Sa'di rahimahullah is saying here فَضَرَبْنَا عَلَىٰ آذَانِهِمْ فِي الْكَهْفِ سِنِينَ أَدَدَ Therefore, we covered up their senses of hearing, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused them to sleep for a number of years in the cave. Imam al-Tabari, who is one of the most, uh, I would say, at the forefront of the ulama of tafsir, he said, Ibn Jaytabi, meaning, Alqayna alayhim al Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered their dua by allowing them to go to sleep. This is miracle number one for them. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved them by for them going to sleep. Miracle number two, as we will see in a moment, that these people were preserved in a cave and nobody uh, sent to them for 300 years. As we will see in the coming ayat, that the cave was very close to the village, meaning people were passing by that cave all the time. And if you've got a cave, if you've got, I don't know, a garage near your house or something like that, or alleyway or something like that, for 300 years nobody thinks, well, I'm going to go down that alleyway to see what's there, or I have a need to go down that alleyway. For 300 years that cave remained untouched. So not only was there a miracle that these people were, number one, preserved in their religion, number two, that the dua was answered, number three, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala closed their eyes and caused them to sleep for 300 years. 300 years, no food, no drink. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them nourishment and sustenance so that they could live. And number five, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved them so that even people, if they were to look, they still wouldn't see anything. Now in this is a key for those people who are suffering from Islamophobia. Alhamdulillah here, wa illa alhamdulillah, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over and over for the fact that we are living here, especially in Leicester, a place where you can practice your religion freely. But that is not the case for even parts of the UK, but it's definitely not the case for Muslims everywhere. What do you do with Islamophobia? What do you do with people attacking Muslims for no apparent reason? Here's the answer. Servitude, seeking his assistance, dua, with ikhlas, فَضَرَبْنَا عَلَىٰ ذَلِهِمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected them. Even if people went looking for them, they wouldn't find them. ثُمَّ بَعَثْنَاهُمْ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resurrected them. لِنَعْلَمَ أَيُّ الْهِزْبَيْنِ أَحْصَى لِمَا لَمِثُوا أَمَدًا If you want, you can put this as ayah number six or miracle number six from these people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused them to sleep for 300 years. What was the purpose? This ayah, ayah number 12, is giving us the reason. Mujahid and others from the ulama of tafsir said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused them to sleep for, as we will see, more than 300 years. And then he resurrected them. Ba'athnahum. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't cause them to die. But when you wake up from your sleep, it is a resurrection. And this is something that we are living with every single day. When you wake up from your sleep, you are simulating the same thing that you will do when you come out of your grave. To the extent that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said that when the person is placed in his grave and then the angels wake him up to ask him the three questions, it's reported in Sunan that this person will rub his eyes and they will be asking him, wake up. We've got some questions to ask you. And he will rub his eyes. What will he say? He will say, okay, you can ask me the questions, but let me pray my salah first. Let me establish my salah. Why? Because the habit for us is when you wake up from your sleep, this has been your habit for how long? How many years? How many times have you woken up? 360 times, 60 years, 70 years, 80 years. This is the tawfiq and the assistance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants to his servant. 
ثُمَّ بَعَثْنَاهُمْ From their sleep they woke up. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say they woke up. He didn't say استَيْقِنَاهُمْ or that He woke them up. بَعَثْنَاهُمْ We resurrected them. لِنَعْلَمْ Now Mujahid is saying here لِنَعْلَمْ Why? So that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can establish something upon His servants. أَيُّ الْحِزْبَيْنِ أَحْسَى لِمَا لَبِثُوا أَمَدًا which of the two parties was best at calculating the time period that they had slept for? Now this is what is apparent and this is what it has in the translation But even the English doesn't really give you the meaning Mujahid is saying here Which party, meaning the people of Kufr, the people of Shirk, the people of Deqanus or the people of Iman Which of these parties are going to look at the people of the cave and say No, these people stayed for this number of years Or if you want Muhammad Sallallahu and the people of the book. So the people of the book will say they stayed for this amount of years. And Muhammad Sallallahu will have revelation come to him and say it was 300 years. This is what we find, which is apparent from this ayah. But Mujahid is saying here, yes, calculation, that is the word that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala has used. However, the meaning is, which party has Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala has preserved? Meaning, what happened to the Roman king? And what happened to his shirk? What happened to the people of shirk? But what happened to the people of Iman at the time of fitna? They made hijrah and they resorted to seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they increased in their tawheed and their servitude to him. Which one of these parties are you talking about now? Which legacy has remained? So we can make it clear Meaning from the party of Iman And the party of Shirk Which is best at counting The people of Shirk Are not even mentioned here And again Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's shielding here Is a separate miracle If you want it, number 6 But in this again is an ayah For the people who fear for their Iman Who are being tested Because of their belief and their faith. Ayah number 13. نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ نَبَأَهُمْ بِالْحَقِّ We will narrate to you, or we shall narrate to you, their story, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in truth. Meaning we will tell you exactly what happened. إِنَّهُمْ فِتْيَةٌ آمَنُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَزِدْنَاهُمْ هُدَى these were a group of young men who believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Stop here. These people started off their connection with Allah. The ikhlas came from them. Nobody can sit and say, well, oh Allah, guide me and not actually mean it. If that is your case, then your dua will not be accepted. That is for guidance, that is for anything else. If you say, oh Allah, you know, I want, to, I want such and such thing to be given to me, but you don't actually mean it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. That du'a is not going to be accepted. From the conditions of du'a, there has to be ikhlas. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, إِنَّهُمْ فِتْيَةٌ آمَنُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ Allah is affirming their sincerity, which then led to them making that du'a. أَتِنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ الرَّحْمَ وَهَيْئِنَا مِنْ لَمِنْ رَشَدًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then said, they believed بِرَبِّهِمْ وَزِدْنَاهُمْ هُدَىٰ They believed in their Lord, so then we increased them in guidance. So where did the ikhlas come from? Where did the, the spur of guidance come from? It came from themselves. At-Tabari, Ibn Jari At-Tabari, Allah, in the tafsir, he said, وَزِدْنَاهُمْ إِلَىٰ إِيمَانِهِمْ بِرَبِّهِمْ إِيمَانًا Meaning, they started off with iman. But then when they made dua, and they showed servitude, and ikhlas and wanting to be sincerely safe from fitna and shirk we increase them we increase them with iman wa basira and insight bi dinihim and religious knowledge wa rabatna ala qulubihim and we made their hearts firm and this is now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praising them and talking how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala aided them in the face of fitna, in the face of shirk, in the face of dajjal, in the face of any kind of test in your iman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَرَبَطْنَا عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ Qtada, rahimahullah said, meaning, 
we fastened for them iman in their hearts. We made it firm. If qamu when they stood up. Now again, the ulama of tafsir have said if qamu meaning when they stood up. <clears throat> has two possible meanings. Either they stood up against the king and they said, we're not going to believe in you, what you're telling us to believe. Or idqamu, meaning they made hijrah. Meaning they abandoned the people of kufr, they abandoned the people of sin, those people calling them to do bad deeds, and they went to the people of goodness. That is what is hijrah. Obviously there was no people of goodness at that time, so the next alternative was to completely isolate themselves. فَقَالُوا رَبُّنَا رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ So then they made dua, our Lord, the Lord of the heavens and the earth, لَن نَدْوَ مِن دُونِهِ إِلَهَا We will never perform shirk with you. And if we were to, لَقَدْ قُلْنَا إِذَنْ شَطَطَى And if we did, we surely would have done something which is an enormous act of disbelief. Qatada, رحمه الله, said شَطَطَى refers to a lie, meaning if we were to fall into shirk, surely we would have said something which is against the truth, we would have lied against you, which is the worst form of lie, and we would never want to do that, because you are our Lord, the Lord of the heavens and the earth. The son of Zayd bin Thabit, a companion of the Rahman, who was a Mufassir, the head of the Mufassir of the Tabi'i, and he said, uh, Rahimahullah, Shatata refers to a mistake. لَقَدْ قُلْنَا إِذَنْ شَطَطَى Had we fallen into shirk, then this would have been the greatest mistake that we would have ever done in our life. Now again here, we are learning from these young men what it means for you to go through difficulty in the life of this dunya, but never give up your faith. So as a benefit, what we learn is to remain upon the correct path, the path of Iman and Tawheed. And the Sirat al Mustaqim. And if you deviate from this, not only are you deviating from doing good deeds, but you are deviating and going far away from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, Imam al Sa'di rahimahullah used this ayah to establish for us, and Sa'di does this over, and inshallah we'll mention them. He does this over throughout uh, the tafsir. He uses this to say <clears throat> that there is a link between, now this is the belief of Ahl Sunnah, unlike the belief of other deviant sects, that there is a link between a Tawheed al rububiyyah and Tawheed al uluhiyyah So in the beginning of their dua, they said, Rabbuna Rabbu Samawati wal Ard, Lordship, Lan Nadwa min dunihi ilaha, we will not supplicate. This is Uluhiyya. Now, nearly all, or perhaps, yes, nearly all of the deviant sects say, as long as you recognize in the existence and the lordship of Allah, that makes you a believer. Is that right or is that wrong? Meaning if a person says, Allah is my Lord and he is the one that created me and he is the one that will resurrect me, that makes you a believer. You are upon Tawheed. Is that correct? What do you think? Huh? No. Why not? Excellent. Every other deviant sect, well, nearly every other deviant sect have said, and you will find this even in Madrasa books, that Tawheed means to know that Allah is your Khaliq. That's it. If you want, you can add to that that he is your Razik. If you want, you can add to that that he will resurrect you. Just to affirm the Lordship is Tawheed for them. But what we are saying here, and this is what the Shaykh is saying as Sa'di, they made dua, Rabbuna Rabbu Samawati wa Lan Lannadu'a, we will not supplicate to other than Allah. And had we done that, mistake in Lordship and mistake in Uluhiyya, laqad qulna idhan shatata, then we will go far astray. Shaitan is called a shaitan because of the shatata, meaning he has gone far astray with his lie and his mistake. Therefore, Sa'di is giving us a benefit and a lesson from this ayah, is that a rububi is connected to uluhiyah, and this is tawheed. If a person doesn't have uluhiyah, which is worshipping Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not making shirk with him, 
then that is not Tawheed. Even if he calls himself a Muhid, even if he says he's a Muslim. Point number one. Point number two, also what we learn from this, and again, something as a belief of Ahlul Sunnah, and I will say that this is specific to Ahlul Sunnah only, all of the deviant sects have failed in this, which is that your Iman goes up and it goes down. So when they supplicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Iman was up. When you are worshipping Allah, is that the same level of Iman where you're not worshipping Allah? Of course, it's not. Hence, the Sa'di rahimahullah is saying here that this is also proof of Sunnah. Ayah number 15. This is now again part of the dua of the people of the cave. They then carry on, they say, these people have fallen into a grave mistake by worshipping gods other than Allah, other than you. Why do they not come with a clear authority, clear proof to establish for us that what they have with them is the haqq? But they don't. Hence, فَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنْ افْتَرَى عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبًا Then who is more sinful than attributing lie upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? As Sa'di rahimahullah, again as a benefit, and again, this is a benefit for Ahl sunnah is that shirk is the greatest sin Hence, why they are saying here is that they have fallen into shirk. So we've asked them, where is your proof of shirk? Hence, they have given importance to the most important thing in their difference between them and the disbelievers. They don't say, oh, well, your religion is different to ours because, you know, I don't know, your names are different, your language is different. All of these are not important. The most important thing is the concept of God, the purpose of your existence, etc. So what they have said here, those people have taken gods besides Allah. That is our difference with them. Amongst other things, but the most important thing has been highlighted. The Sa'di rahimahullah is saying here, this teaches us the severity of shirk. And that it is the greatest sin. Therefore the Muslim must learn iman and tawheed and disassociate himself from shirk and the people of shirk. And if he lives with this, then he is the one who has the sultan in bayin. He is the one who has the clear authority and the clear proof. Ayah number 16. These young men, they said to one another that we will isolate ourselves from their shirk and we will worship only Allah. So they sought refuge in the cave يَنْشُرُ لَكُمْ رَبُّكُمْ مِنْ رَحْمَتِهِ And your Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala, made a way for His mercy reaching them. You have to remember, these are not prophets. Just like we are not prophets. Allah made a miracle for them. In the face of adversity, in the face of oppression. وَيُهَيِّئْ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَمْرِكُمْ مِرْفَقَاءٍ And we will make easy for you. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, وَيُهَيِّئْ لَكُمْ meaning you. Now, the ulama have said that this is referring to the people of the cave, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is responding to their dua, or it could be general, meaning you, the people of Iman. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you success as long as you hold on to your religion and show ikhlas and wanting to be guided in the first place. Now here, as we have said in the previous ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 13, we will tell you about their story. Here now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the description. Now, what we have already seen is that they were preserved. For the Rabna ala adhanihim, they were caused to sleep. But here we have another miracle that was given to them, which is that they received provision from a way that they didn't expect. And this is important for the believer in the time of fitna. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not only will He preserve you, but He will provide you and sustain you within that fitna. Amongst that, preservation. And you might have seen the sun when it rose, declining to the right from their cave, meaning they were sleeping in a way and the cave was setting on the right, of the cave. So that means the west was this way, to the right of the cave. 
and when it set turning away from them to the left. So sorry, it rose from the right of the cave and it set to the left. Whilst they lay in the midst of the cave, وَهُمْ فِي فَجْوَةٍ مِّنْ ذَلِكَ مِنْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ These are from the miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to them. مَنْ يَهْدِ اللَّهِ فَهُوَ الْمُهْتَدِ Whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, surely that person is guided. وَمَنْ يُدْلِلْ فَلَنْ تَجِلَ لَهُ وَلِي مُرْشِلًا And whoever is misguided, then that person will never find a guiding friend. Allah is al-wali, one of his names. Meaning he is the friend to the believer, meaning the one who guides the believer. And he will not guide him, and he will not find a wali, and he will not find a murshida. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here that he preserved them. And the sun went from the, the east of them and he set to the west of them, from the right of them and it came to the left of them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserves them. Ibn Abbas and Sayyid ibn Jubair and others have said, Taqriduhum, that's what you mean without shimal. Meaning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed for the sun to go round them whilst they themselves were left there preserved. Not only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took them away from fitna, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved them amongst that miracle that they were receiving. And all of this as a benefit shows us the qudra and the ability of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon his slaves. Ayah number 18, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَتَحْسَبُهُمْ إِيْقَادٌ وَهُمْ رُقُودٌ you will, If you were to look at them, you would have thought that they were awake. Which basically means that they were preserved with their eyes open. They were sleeping with their eyes open. But in actual fact, they were asleep. وَنُقَلِّبُهُمْ ذَاتِ الْيَمِينِ وَذَاتِ الشِّمَالِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moved them from the right to the left. Right to the left. So now, you know, as you sleep, you move from the right and sometimes you move to your back. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was doing this for them moving them to the right and moving to the left. Now, the ulama have said that this is a benefit because had they stayed on the right for 300 years, obviously, that would have harmed their bodies. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moved them from the right to the left. And their dog was at the entrance of the cave. Some of the ulama have said here, okay, we'll get to that benefit. Had you seen them in this state, you would have surely run away from them. And you would have been frightened at the sight of seeing these young men in this state. It wasn't normal. They were sleeping with their eyes open and they were moving right to left, right to left. There are many benefits from this ayah. Number one, a dog, which is something which is najis was preserved and raised in its rank and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a dog which is normally something which is haram for us to keep unless you've got a valid reason but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this thing which is not, it's not something that you probably wouldn't have in your home why? because of the quality of the iman and, and steadfastness and worship that these young men had what's the benefit here? the benefit here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves a group of people, anything that is connected to those group of people will also attain some of the barakah and the mercy. To the extent that even the dog is mentioned. What we also learn, as we mentioned before, is that the ulama of tafsir have said that this ayah gives us an indication that the cave was actually very close to the people of the cave. Had you seen them? Meaning that it was possible for them to see them. They weren't completely tucked away somewhere. It was possible for people to see them. And had you seen them? Hence Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it as a miracle that he preserved them amongst the people that were trying to attack them and oppress them. Also as a benefit in Aqeedah, Imam Sa'di is saying here, this is actually proof against the people. Now here, I don't want to go too far away from the discussion, and I do believe that it's already been roughly an hour, an hour and we've still got many ayat to cover. But Sa'di, rahimahullah, is saying here that the Asha'ira and the Matrudiyya, these are two deviant sects that live amongst us. They believe in a concept which is called Jabr. 
Meaning you do not have free will for your actions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing the action. So you just look down now and you look back up. You didn't do that according to them. They say that this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing it. Okay, so then how is I going to go to Jannah or the person going to go to the hellfire? You are just a means. Maybe you even had people say this. I'm just a means. That was just a means. It's what Allah wanted. Now, of course, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed. But the idea of Jabr is completely false. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us free will. And you make the decision to do good deeds or to do bad deeds. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already recorded this. But you are the one who has free will. So now, the Asha'ir and the Matrudi has said, ha, look, here's proof for our claim that you were forced. These men, they were being flipped right and left. Who is the one that's flipping them? Allah. Therefore, you're sitting like that, Allah is the one that's doing it. You're sitting like that, Allah is the You just blinked, Allah did it. You didn't blink. Just like these men who were being flipped. Where's the proof against them? Imam Sa'adi is saying here, look, in the previous ayah, ayah number 17, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَنْ يَهْدِهِ اللَّهِ فَهُوَ الْمُهْتَدِ Meaning, if Allah guides you, then you are the one that is guided. وَمَنْ يُدْلِلْ فَلَنْ تَجِدَ لَهُ وَلِيمُ شِنَا And then you will not find somebody who will guide you. Meaning, you are the one who wants to seek the guidance itself. When you have that guidance, you will then act upon, through your own free will, that guidance. Therefore, there is no proof in a miracle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to a group of people. And yes, He is the one that did turn them. That is not proof to say that all of us now have jabr and no accountability and no free will. And the contradiction is also clear because none of us are living in a miracle when they are. And if you're going to use that as an ayah, as, a, as, a, as proof for the, the aqeedah, then we'll have to say that everyone is living in a miracle, which is not the case. Also in this ayah here, some of the ulama of tafsir, now you have to understand tafsir is of different types and you can get some tafsir which is fiqhi. The ulama have used this here to say, what do you do when prayer times cannot be calculated? Now we, we live in the West when summertime, uh, Maghrib and Isha and Fajr specifically becomes very difficult. These men, they live for 300. The, the companions asked the Messenger of Allah, so the first day of the Dajjal is going to be like 40 years. How are we going to pray Salah when one day is like 40 years? So here the ulama have used this ayah to say, you pray according to what you have in front of you. So imagine you've got one day which is 40 years long, or you've lived for one day, because they will say, that 300 years felt like, three, that 300 years felt like one day. How do you calculate salah when one day is 300 years? You do it as no. Also, from the fiqhi benefits, is that there is proof in this ayah, that is permissible if a person needs to, to sleep on his left. Otherwise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have let them sleep on their left if it was something which was completely forbidden. Hence, it is makru, it is sunnah for you to sleep on your right, and it is dislike for a person to sleep on his left. But if there is a need for you to sleep on your left, for whatever reason, then you can. Also from the fiqh benefits is the importance of a person uh, seeking the provisions of Allah. This is what the ulama have mentioned. Hence Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here in this ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided for them for that period. So from the fiqh benefits, even though it's a lesson, even though it's not part of the tafsir directly, we learn the importance of you seeking your risk. And again, this is unfortunate, especially from the youth. There is, I would even call it a, as a disease, that a lot of people think that I don't need to go to work, I can stay at home and I can claim benefits and all those things. Uh, the ulama are quite clear that it is not befitting for a believer to depend upon others. And he should go out there and earn with his own two hands. Ayah number 19 وَكَذَلِكَ بَعْثْنَاهُمْ لِيَتَسَاءَلُوا We resurrected them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the translation it says here, and we awakened them. 
so that they may question one another. So they started questioning. How long did we sleep for? He said, we slept for a day. Another one said, no, no, it wasn't a day. That's too long. Half a day. How could you sleep for a day? Yes, it was a long sleep. Maybe it was about 10 hours, 12 hours. So they started questioning one another. What's happened to us? And then they eventually just said, we don't know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. How long you slept. Bima labithum. So one of them said, take this silver coin, go to the village and get some food. We need some food now. Get food which is azka, meaning sharia compliant. These are the people of shirk. Preserve yourself in the time of fitna. And again, it's very unfortunate that you're finding Muslims you know, consuming things and becoming very easy uh, in, in what they regard as being halal and haram and whether it's stunned or non-stunned and all these different things and they eat everything from everywhere and this is very important that these men who are preserving themselves from fitna were also preserving their provisions and the things that they were eating <laughs> Bring some food, bring risk from Allah but وليتلطف. Be careful Now in this is a, a fiqhi benefit also is that the ulama have said that the way you conduct yourself in the time of fitna amongst the people of shirk Good manners. What does it say here in the translation? Be careful. It says here be careful. But waytalattaf really actually is broader than that. Meaning, display care, display good manners. Wala yushiranna bikum ahada. Make sure nobody finds out about you. Through your manners, be careful, be good, be balanced, do not harm anyone. Take into the consideration the feelings of other people. Because if they find out when you go to get that food for us, then they will either make you apostate from your religion, before that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, either they will kill you and punish you, or they will make you apostate from your religion. And if you were to do that, you will never be successful. Fiqhi benefit from this it is permissible for us to appoint an agent to do some work for you. Here's a coin, go get that for me. Also, from the benefits here, is that these people, when they were uh, awoken from their sleep, it wasn't a phase. It wasn't just something that, yeah, you know, we went to sleep like that, and now we've woken up now, you know, I tried Islam, let me try something else now. Or let me compromise. Or let me change something. These people, even after the miracle, still wanted to be preserved. The fitna was over. They were not aware. But the fitna was over. By this time, when they go back into the village, everyone's upon Tawheed. They were none the wiser at this stage. But they were still very careful about their iman. And they didn't want to expose themselves to a bad environment. <clears throat> Twenty-one. And thus we made them. It says here, It says in the translation, we made their case known. meaning, when they came out, everybody had recognized them. Meaning, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala elevated these young men. They were successful in fitna through ibadah and worship and tawheed and du'a and sincerity and all these other things, iman and taqwa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevated them. They were not prophets. They were, not, they were people like us. Individuals who were following the Nabi. Why? So that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can establish upon the creation that the promise of Allah is true. And that the hour is going to be established. Meaning everything from the unseen is correct. And these men remained firm upon that, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevated them in the dunya and in the akhir, إِذْ يَتَنَازَعُونَ بَيْنَهُمْ Then, after they recognized these men, they began to dispute with one another. Now this is important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in more than one place in the Qur'an that the people of religion will not start fighting one another except after proof has come to them. It's strange that after the proof has come to you, really that should create unity. A messenger has come, a book has come, the sunnah has been completed. 
That should actually keep unity. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, إِذْ يَتَنَازَعُونَ بَيْنَهُمْ After they have seen the miracle, that's when they started fighting. إِذْ يَتَنَازَعُونَ بَيْنَهُمْ أَمْرُهُمْ فَقَالُوا بْنُوا عَلَيْهِمْ بُنْيَانٌ رَبُّهُمْ أَعْلَمُ بِهِمْ The people, now why did they start fighting? After these men passed away, they split. Some of them said, let's do grave worship, in a sense. Let's build upon them a tomb and a shrine so we can remember these men. They're not just going to get a normal burial. These are the people of the cave. 300 years Allah preserved them. Another group of people said, no, this is haram. This is not the religion of Isa. You have to block off the means to shirk. They started fighting. Some of them said, let's build upon them a shrine. The people who said, let's build upon them a shrine, they overcome the people of Tawheed, so they built upon them a masjid, a place of worship. Sayakulun, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to talking about what happens after that. Sayakulun a thalathatun rabi unkalbuhum. Now, this is continuing on to the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Just three, four more ayat, inshallah. They then started disputing the nature of the miracle. Some of them said there were three of them, and the fourth was the dog. Wayakulun a khamsatun sadisun kalbuhum. They said four of them, and the fifth one was the dog. Rajman bin ghayb. They were. Uh, guessing about the unseen. The ulama of tafsir is saying here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is blaming them for their innovation. Meaning the people of Bok deviated from Dawheed and they innovated also into the religion, Rajman bin Ghayb. And some of them said there were seven of them and the eighth one was the dog. قُلْ رَبِّي أَعْلَمُ بِإِدَّتِهِمْ مَا يَعْلَمُهُمْ إِلَّا قَلِيلٌ Say Allah, my Lord, is the one who knows about how many of them there were and only a small number know about this. Meaning, only a small number have remained upon the haqq. فَلَا تُمَارِ فِيهِمْ Now this address goes to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Muhammad, as Jalil ibn Tawri is saying here, رَحِمُهُ اللَّهُ فَلَا تُمَارِ Ya Muhammad, do not argue with them, do not you know, debate with them. He said, do not debate with the people of Kitab except by explaining to them that this is what has happened, this is the haq. And you have no need to refer back to them and to see what they have in their books, etc. Because you are the people of ilm and they are not the people of ilm. They are the people of Rajman bin Ghayb. They are the people who have innovated. Ayah number 23 Now again to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Do not say I'm going to do something tomorrow إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ Allah, Except that you say Allah with it Now we talked about this last week This ayah or these ayat Well this is part of the ayat that will reveal Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said I will tell you about these men But he didn't say Allah. So the revelation got delayed But when do we say Allah? Ibn Uthaymin Rahimahullah has a very good explanation In his Ta'liq of al mimiyyah if I'm not mistaken, uh, which is a, a small poetry by uh, Ibn Qayyim. He said, Insha'Allah, we say when we're talking about something about the future, and this is something which is well known. Why do we say Insha'Allah? We say Insha'Allah so that Allah will bless us in our decision for the future. I'm going to go to work, Insha'Allah. I'm going to do such and such, Insha'Allah. That, with the permission of Allah, He will facilitate and make easy my affair. So the reason why we do it is to seek Allah's blessings. When do we do it? Now there are two ways of doing it. Number one, if you want to do something in the future and you are not sure whether that thing will come about, you say inshallah. If you want to do something in the future and you need Allah's assistance, you will say inshallah. But there is a third time when it becomes permissible for you to say inshallah and permissible for you to even leave inshallah. Which is when you have a firm resolve to do something, you do not need to say inshallah. Maghrib is in about 20 minutes. I'm going to pray Maghrib here. Do you need to say inshallah? You can, because you're not certain. But if you've got a firm resolve, you don't need to say inshallah. What's the proof of this? The Messenger of Allah found the Yahud fasting Ashura. And he said, if I am alive next year, I will, find, I will fast the ninth day and the tenth day. Did he say inshallah? He didn't say inshallah. So then how do we reconcile? 
be reconciled because the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, I will surely fast the ninth and the tenth, and he didn't say, inshallah. And this is proof to say that if you have a firm resolve of doing a good deed, especially to do something, but it might not necessarily be a good deed, I'm going to go shopping after this, I'm going to go home after this. You don't necessarily need to say inshallah because now you're talking about a firm intention that you have in yourself. When do you say inshallah? When you do not know. And you hope that Allah will facilitate. And you hope that Allah will bless about something in the future. Hence, Do not say about something tomorrow which you do not know is going to happen. Except that you say inshallah. Remember Allah when you have not remembered Him. Meaning, if you have forgotten, remember Allah. And again, the fiqhi benefit here is that you can make qada of those things, of adhkar. So if you have forgotten to say bismillah before you eat, you can make qada of that. If you have forgotten to do your morning adhkar, you can make qada of that when you remember. وَذْكُرْ رَبَّكَ إِذَا نَسِيتُ But the, the stronger and the more direct meaning here is remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whilst you have been in a state of negligence. Most of our states are states of negligence. We are not remembering Allah. So be of those people who remember Allah and don't be of those people who are constantly in nisyan and neglect of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَقُلْ عَسَىٰ أَنْ يَهْدِيَنِي رَبِّي لِأَقْرَبَ مِنْ هَذَا رَشَدَىٰ And say, perhaps it will be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will guide me to the truth which is nearer than this. Meaning, this is a miracle that was given to them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will teach me the affairs of these people and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give me a greater miracle. Then the people of the book, at the time of Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, started arguing and they started saying, okay, this is the story of the cave, this is fine, he knows about it. How long did they stay for in the cave? So they started disputing. Then the haq, uh, and Kalbi and others have said that this is the next ayah that was revealed. They didn't know how long. So they said to Muhammad, how long? Because now they started disputing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah says, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed them to remain in the cave for 300 years and he increased it by nine. Now, the reason why he said he increased it by nine, some of the ulama have said that this is the difference between the lunar and the Gregorian calendar. So this is lunar, this is Gregorian. And others have said, the Christians were saying 300. They said, no, he stayed, they stayed there for 300. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, وَلَّبِثُ فِي كَفْهِمْ ثَلَاثَ مِئَةً Yes, 300. Was دَادُ تِسْعَى In actual fact, it was 309. To correct the people, who were making Rajmah bin Ghaib, those people who had innovated and guessing on the unseen. Last ayah uh, for today, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلِ اللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا لَبِثُوا Say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew more detail about them, how long they stayed, uh, stayed and the details of how they stayed, more than this. Why? لَهُمْ غَيْبُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Everything from the unseen belongs to him in the heavens and the earth. أَبْسِرْ بِهِ وَأَسْمِئْ He sees everything and he hears everything. And they have no friend as a guider and a protector. Except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, therefore do not perform shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his lordship or in his worship in the slightest. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he keeps us firm upon tawheed and iman and that he protects us from all forms of fitna, internal and external. Hada, wallahu a'lam. Sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad. وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين